So the picture that I wanted to tackle today, um, and I put this on an opacity, um, was this picture. And I think this picture, even though it may seem, I don't know, maybe to you, it may seem simple um, because quite frankly, there's basically like two values, three values, right? And I'm gonna be trying to, I always kind of tend to overload people with information because I get too excited. So if I need to slow down or something, please let me know. Um, but I'm gonna be talking about this, uh, about grids, about design, about matrix studies and how I would build that up. Because I think before you go into tackling complexity with simplicity, which is the title of my piece. And actually, I'm sorry, I forgot to open up something really quick. So let me open up something. Um, and I had this idea of this talk after I did this piece right here. And I, so my Achilles heel is cityscapes and rocks, like anything, <laughs> anything rocks and geometric kind of wise. I start freaking out. And so that's why I chose that waterfall for myself because I know I would freak out um, with all those rocks and everything. Okay, this is not how I usually have my stuff. Um, anyways, you can see um, this is kind of more or less the final, but I'm gonna take off the layers to show you guys how I started off, okay? So I for this, I used a simple, um, uh, rule of thirds grid. I sometimes also use a diamond grid. If you take in my mentorship, I talk about this as well. Alex is nodding. <laughs> um, because they're just very helpful for design. And I'm going to share some tips right now. If you are ever struggling with um, something, a picture that is, you know, seemingly complex, there's lots of people, lots of shapes, lots of actual stuff going on, like rocks, people, buildings, um, I find that it's it's not even your skill that will dictate how well you paint something. It's literally how well you can see past all that stuff. And I really believe that the angle of perspective that you approach something is paramount to how well you can render something. Your ability to see past all the artists that I admire, you know, Mike Hernandez, Batu Dugarzapov. I mean, there's so many out there. Um, Isaac Levitin, you know, I love a lot of Russian painters. I'm just throwing a few, a few off. I'm really bad at remember names. Um, William Rischel, these are all, you know, fine artists, um, digital artists, you know, they have the ability to, to know where to simplify and where to add that noise. And when I say complexity, I don't necessarily mean rendering. I think there's a difference between that. And I like to sort of, um, uh, highlight the difference because that for me myself personally I never actually think uh, that I am can you guys all see my screen okay I'm just checking really quick yeah okay I never really think that I am rendering okay I never really consider myself that I like to say that I am kind of creating the illusion of something because I understand where I, I need to have clean edges soft edges where I need to put the noise to give just enough info to the viewer, okay? So um, I will always start off with a quick line drawing. And if you guys looked at my demo yesterday, which um, I know some people had said that there's some issues. Um, um, there's some, there are some issues with um, um, watching, rewatching the thing. It will be up soon because I know Sean recorded it. Uh, I talk about my favorite pen and my Tiffany's core essentials pack, which will be coming out to everyone soon. Um, is the Proco pencil. And the Proco pencil is great for sketching out really quickly like this and even doing really quick digital sketches. I don't really spend a lot of time doing this sketch. Like some people would really do a detailed sketch. And I'm gonna be talking about sort of my process. My process, I'm gonna kind of be drawing a chart right after this to talk about that. Um, and actually I, I, I probably won't be reading the chat. So if you guys wanna ask a question at any point, just quickly, kindly unmute yourself and ask me because I, I don't think I can balance that all at once. <laughs> I just realized that. So I changed protocol rule, just kindly raise your hand if that's even possible. Is it possible? I don't know, just unmute yourself. It's all cool, all casual. Charlotte Higgins raised a hand. Okay, I don't even know how to like, you can just ask your question. <laughs> no, uh -huh. just sorry, Chantel around. Higgins, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, you're okay. I was just um, to you, use the reaction hand up would ha be handy as well. Um, so we don't talk over you because I I feel awful talking over you because I just want to get all your info. So oh, okay, cool. So yeah, that's well, I was just putting up to kind of show the 
it's usable. Oh, that's- awesome. Great. Okay. So then I can call on you, right? And I'll be like, oh, someone raised their hand. Cool. Got it. Thank you guys. Um, um, what was I saying? Uh, I lost my train of thought. Uh, yeah. So um, the ability to see, right? Uh, oh yeah. So I don't spend that much time doing lines. Some people, you know, will spend a lot of time doing, doing, you know, really detailed line because it's my style, but also my personality. I'm a very impatient person. So once I can get the gist of it rolling in my head, I'll pretty much bam right into shape. Okay. I'm a shape person. I need to put down those shapes color notes of correct value for me to start seeing things. That is my way of working. Doesn't mean you need to copy me, okay? When I teach all these things, I never want to tell people this is the way and the only way because everyone has their own methods and workflow that works for them. And that's what makes art so you, you, you know, unique and creative, right? Is it important to keep? Uh, is someone talking? What's going on? Everyone, when someone is coming by default, they are on mute and you need to uh, fastly mute yourself. So they have a, like, if someone, oh. connects, yeah, we have, okay. a, if you listen to someone or something, you will know, but you have a second for unmute yourself. Oh, but- got it. Okay. That's fine. I, I probably should have muted people. Wow. This is a great learning experience for me. I'm sorry. Please bear with me, guys. I, I guess there's a way for me to mute people. I've never done that before. Um, if you guys, when you guys come in, if you guys can mute yourself, that would be great. Um, otherwise I'm just going to keep talking unless it sounds like a question. So for me, I, I will start quickly bamming into shape. Okay. So, um, I will show the reference image in a minute, but I just want to show you before you have sort of this preconception, how I'm, how I'm interpreting the biggest masses. Okay. Um, to me, painting is a balance of um, how you design color. And I'm not saying this in any particular order, but line, which is rhythms. Okay, I'm gonna talk about that. Line, rhythms, uh, line and rhythms, color, masses, values, texture slash noise. I kind of think about all those things um, when I'm painting. Right now, when I'm when I'm uh, putting down the first, you know, the first large masses, I'm not so much thinking about design right now, honestly, as more as trying to get the holistic image in. As I fine tune, I start to think more and more about how to carve in my shapes, how the shapes weave into each other. Um, right now, I'm just trying to get the holistic picture, and I think that's another really important point I want to hone in because. Um, because um, because a lot of times people tend to think they have to work on one area at a time. And then you're like, okay, I got this area good. Then I'll move into the next area, then the next area. And that to me is sort of all feeding into seeing, right? Are you seeing the whole picture? Are you seeing fragments of it? Because what you run into when you start, um, and again, if this is how you work, by all means, power to you. That's just, I would, I, I would throw myself off like that. So this is from my personal experience, okay? Um, you tend to build up one area like too much and then the other areas lack and you can't constantly compare. So um, when I paint, you'll see me jumping from one area to another. Um, so right now you can see here that doesn't really have a change. None of these really have a change. I put a color filter. Now, this is a very important step for me that I like to say push and pull. I will put down shapes, but then I will start smudging. I will start losing everything, actually over losing everything to the point sometimes where you're like, whoa, all the things you put down, it's like, what, what was the point of that? Um, and I talked about this in my demo yesterday, but it likened to, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the painter Rule Lee. He's a really great oil painter. I highly recommend you guys um, look up. Um, I'll type the name in the chat right now. So Rule Lee, and he has this method where my friend went to his workshop and um, he, he was painting, painting, painting. At the end of the workshop, do you know what he did? He took a palette knife and he basically wiped off all his paint like from his day's work. And I thought, why would you do that? Like, what? that's just like so counterintuitive. Like, why, how would you have the guts even to do that? You know, like, obviously there's some things you liked. I didn't understand that concept probably till a year later when I realized that I would actually in, intuitively do that with my digital work where when I'm stuck, actually both my digital, my gouache work. And that's why I just love how both feed into each other because the techniques that I use for both, I definitely weave into each other. I will do this with gouache 
Or if I don't like something's looking, I'll take a big one and a half inch brush with water and just swipe over the area that's not working. That has saved me, I would say probably 100% of the time because I see new things emerging from it. It's almost that thing where you have to unlearn, di di digress, seemingly digress in order to jump two steps forward, right? Um, and so when I do this step right now from this to this, I'm seeing what I might not need. I'm seeing areas of rest that I can actually hold on to and areas that I can build up to. And this is a really important method or technique or concept, whatever you want to call it, that I will um, uphold to the end of any painting. And that's why I say a lot of my paintings, you know, the finished paintings, they're usually a combo of what my previous layers. Um, so now I'm starting to add the light, okay? And that makes a big difference. You see light and shadow, right? The number one step I always teach people is that before you start any painting, you don't wanna start painting until you have a clear understanding of what your ratio of light to shadow is in a painting and where the light direction is coming from and, um, and, and what is in your shadow and what is in your light. Okay, so... Um, if, if I pull up the reference uh, image here, now you can see as I'm constantly building up and adding light, adjusting value, I'm adding more and more little shapes, AKA I count them as noise, okay? So from here to here, all this I count as texture. That texture though needs to feed into the, to the to benefit of the painting. You know, texture doesn't, what I see a lot is with all those cool brushes you can do in Photoshop, someone who doesn't have enough control of their texture, it can get over textury really fast. And I like to say it's oversaturated with too many things. It, it becomes very gimmicky very fast. So I, I also do this too. You can see, I, I just went from here to here and I smudged from here to here, I sharpened it and I'm adding little details here and there. So from here to here, do you see what I did? I took my fun jitter brush and I just made this brush like not too long ago and it creates this really fun noise and I like to call this noise, okay? Um, and from here, the changes see are, are much smaller, but um, you can see from here to here what happened was this. I decided this felt too busy. So I actually um, simplified. You see, I went from this to this and moved some things over and I simplified. And I was, so what happened was I was toggling my previous layers and um, I was analyzing what was, what was needed. So from this to this, you can see, I, got, I felt that too busy and it got too dark in the background. So these changes start being more and more minute, okay? Um, so, so basically how I like to kind of talk about it is when you're tackling something with complexity, I like to say, you know, in the beginning, you're, how do I, how do I do this in a chart? You're sort of, it's sort of like this where, you're sort of like speeding up and then it sort of plateaus a little bit and then you kind of you kind of slow down here so this initial stage right here is when you're what i would encourage you guys to do is when you're going bombarded with something complex to go with your intuition and try to see the large masses in this stage here i'm frantically putting down shapes i'm not thinking so much about you know accuracy or anything now as you reach the part here and i always reach a part where where I'm almost at a crossroads. And it's like, okay, this is the part where I know I wanna slow down and I know I wanna pay attention to how every specific shape is going to affect my painting. And then from then on, it's very, very slow. And it may seem like all these little changes don't do much, but they do, okay? So one thing I wanna stress is that little changes, they add a lot to the painting. So it's sort of that sort of curve bell that you can think about. This painting right here, uh, I'm gonna talk about grids really briefly. You know, a lot of people kind of wing design, and I'm still learning about design and composition as well. But for me, my personal journey in learning is how important design is. I'm going to stress this one more time. Design and value are paramount to color. Okay, I always say this, and this is something because color is the juicy part, right? That's why I picked a painting that doesn't have a lot of color purposely, because I'm going to show you how I would amp up the color. If someone had this photo, right, they would probably paint this gray and black. I could see an opportunity for wonderful warmth, pushing the color temperature within the same value. I just told you my biggest secret of all time, if you guys were listening, pushing color temperature of similar value in a shadow area or light area, okay? That's how you get those beautiful, subtle shifts of color. So really quick, if we analyze with the grid. So the rule of thirds, everyone knows this. So what I'm seeing, and I also drew some lines of action on top, what I'm seeing is that I want my waterfall to hit that sort of pinnacle area to hit 
this right rule of thirds right here. If you can see right here, which you'll see the center line grid, that middle horizon line is kind of hitting the center, but it's not a clear because you have mist and atmosphere blocking that. Also the bottom rule of thirds here, we have some top of the rocks hitting here, and we have a group of rock rocks around the right rule of thirds and a cluster of rocks around the left. And so that's how I'm briefly sort of analyzing this. I'm gonna take this into account when I'm um, painting my own painting. Now with the center line grid, you're basically analyzing diagonals, okay? So what I see here with this one is that I can see that there's a beautiful diagonal that I can, I can use right here. Okay, also you can see how that center line grid, like I said, crosses through here. That's also another beautiful diagonal that I can arrange this cluster of rocks, cluster of rocks right here. And, and so you're using these lines as guidelines to kind of um, help you, like there's cluster of rocks in this triangle area right here. Um, and so I'm using the, all these sort of small clusters to sort of create irregular shapes and, and different sized groups to lead your eyes to the waterfall. Now, in terms of rhythm and line, right? It talks about composition and, cre and creating a painting as, as seeing what your rhythms are. I see some beautiful, strong diagonals of all differently angled rhythms, okay? Um, a great person to study for this is the Japanese paper artist, Masayasu Yuchida. And what's remarkable about his paintings is that they're all made out of paper. If you guys look up his artwork, but they look like digital painting. It's absolutely insane and beautiful. And he has such great eye for composition. If you want to study composition, study this guy. Um, so anyways, I'm just quickly analyzing the rhythm, seeing how my eye can zigzag up and towards here, right? And in terms of verticals counteracting that, we're having a strong, beautiful, slightly diagonal vertical with the pathway leading your eye. Now, of course, this is not one way, right? There's also other ways I can see this. Maybe, maybe I see this vertical here, maybe I see this coming and leading your way down here. Um, so there's just many pathways that I'm looking at. Working off of that, I wanted to show you guys how I would start off doing some quick matrix studies. And because it's not about color, by the way, um, because if you wanna know how to tackle complexity with simplicity, it starts off, I believe, with design. And it's not about, it starts off with seeing and be able to do design. I started a really quick one already. Um, so I'm gonna turn off all this, bring this back, and let's see how speedy I can do this. Okay, so I kind of can see, I started off with a quick line and I, this is one of my favorite block-in brushes. Um, that I like to use. And with matrix studies, by the way, another great guy to study this is Jeremy Lipking. No, sorry, Jeremy Lipking. He's a great artist too. Jeremy Fenske. Um, if you guys know Lin Chen, Jeremy Fenske, they're a couple. Uh, he actually is amazing at value studies like this. And so basically what a matrix study is, if you guys have never done this before, it is basically a two value study. You're like, what? How can I do something with two values? You can't. That is going to actually strengthen your sense of design even more. What you're doing is you're forcing yourself to group more. How do you tackle complexity with simplicity? You force yourself to see where you can group, not full, force yourself. You train yourself. That sounds really forceful. You train yourself to see where you can group. And I believe a really helpful exercise is matrix studies. It's like, how can I group these rocks here and see that really simple pattern of light and dark just coming in with the water? Right. Um, so I'm like, OK, I already see here. I'm like, OK, I can have a group of rocks right here. How do I want to group that here? How do I want maybe like this rock to come? How far do I want that rock to come in? And I'm already figuring out design at this moment. Do I want a water to come in here and connect here? When you put down any stroke, it's a shape. You best pay attention that that shape is well designed. OK, um, no matter as simple or abstract it can be. By the way, look at here, look at the beautiful way the light is just um, hitting those rocks, right? That is a beautiful way to sort of start outlining the edge rim light of those rocks. All you need is light and shadow. You don't need to actually paint rocks. You need to actually figure out how to indicate those rocks, right? Without actually painting every rock. That is every artist, you know, challenge to do. Why would you paint every rock when you can find a shortcut to simplify, right? Are you gonna make these rocks equally spaced or are you going to sort of make sure that you have one rock here that's triangular, maybe another one here, maybe one right here. How are they going to be, right? So you can explore various comps 
you know, this way. Maybe I'll duplicate this really quickly and I'll explore, you know, how it looked like if we just had no, you know, uh, what do you call it? No, no top at the end. We had to explore with the topper, uh, a higher, I can't tell, a higher diagonal, a steeper diagonal. Nature will give you great inspiration. And I think in this case, there's a lot of good things going on in this photo. But in other pa in cases, you as an artist probably have to do the design work. That's what I meant. Because basically my art background was okay. I was raised copying things. And, it, and for me personally, it is, um, actually, I just realized something bad about this. Um, I'm trying to carve out this rock here a little bit more and get that beautiful silhouette that I'm getting. Um, another thing you can see about me is that I work all in one layer and um, that's just that's just easier for me. So you can see I'm, I'm, I'm carving out that rock there. I'm finding um, that. So that's what I mean. Um, and um, to take nature as inspiration, but not always be a slave to it, right? Okay. Uh, so, so you mean um, to make it more aesthetically pleasing? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, okay. as in design wise, right? You can always, um, yeah. you know, sometimes there's like, like nature has a lot of tangents. Like in yesterday's demo, one of the photos I did, there's a tangent of the house to the peninsula in the background. So I moved the house down, you know, things like that. That I count okay. um, kind of all as design, right? And to be able to train your eye to catch that. For example, you know, like here, and the picture here, there's a lot of little shapes going on. I treat this all as a triangle, okay? And you're like, but this is so boring, it's black and white. This is how I think in color. Color is secondary to me, okay? As much as I love color, guys, um, training yourself to think like this, I cannot stress how important it is. I'm still learning about this. You know, it's like, how the heck do I, do I organize these things in the best way possible? If I have too many shapes going on like, like this, like, does that look pleasing? Not really. I have to organize those angles now. Where are angles going on into straights? Where are curves leading into straights, et cetera, et cetera? Or do I have a light patch right here of that water? Is it gonna connect to this? Is it gonna gradually, you know, how, how do they, these shapes feed in? Is this too bright right here? Should I group that back all into a darker value? These are questions I'm always asking myself. Yeah, there's a lot of astronomical ways you can, you can tackle it. Anyway, so here, for example, it's like, how do I connect that rock, this rock right here? Maybe this rock is too high. Um, maybe there's another waterfall coming down here. I mean, there's so many things all mine while keeping where I want to keep that actual waterfall. So I think I actually like this steeper diagonal more. Uh, and I, I don't really like this middle area, but I'm just going to go ahead and just uh, figure that out. I'm going to go ahead and start with a toned canvas. Okay. So very close to likewise how I showed you in my other city painting. Uh, I'm going to do with a quick line first, locking in kind of the big shapes. I can already see this very clearly in my head, just a matter of executing it. Um, placing this. I know there's a shape right here. So I kind of skipped the line part, sorry. <laughs> so uh, this is basically another form of a matrix study, but with different colors, okay? Very quickly, I'm going to, let's see, I'm gonna start introducing color, but I, I really do love the monochromaticness of, and the grays. I, I just love grays, by, by the way. If you know me, I just love playing with grays. That's why I think I'm gonna love Iceland. I'm so excited to go there in October. So here, what I'm doing, I'm basically just figuring out a, a roadmap. It's going to look really crappy, maybe. Sometimes, actually, I like my paintings in the first few moments because basically, like I said, with that quick chart that I made, I'm not really thinking too much about anything right now except putting down these shapes that I can refine, working very fast before I can let myself overthink. Um, that's <laughs> it's kind of how I, I work. And this, this block and brush lets me do basically that I'm basically like I'm not really thinking about I mean yes I, I do kind of think about light logic and all that stuff but more so I'm just trying to get these like that's a little bit too bright but maybe we can play with that a little bit later I'm, I'm actually referencing this Ray Roberts painting and I'll actually pull this up for you guys hi Tiffany I had a question uh like if there is a photo reference and uh, it has extreme complexity like even in the environment that um the middle ground, foreground, and uh, the background have extreme complexity. For example, uh, a scene of a forest with a lot of branches. So yeah. How will you uh, convert that into uh, black and white value, only black and white value? 
Well, I would ask myself, what, what are the values of the branches, right? If they're mostly yeah. dark against the light shape, I would group that all as a dark shape. So really quick thing, actually you brought up a really good point about trees, okay? A lot of times people right. paint trees like this. I'm just gonna do a really quick demo. They go trunk, branches, canopy, right? This is how yeah. I paint any tree, okay? If you look at my wash painting, so basically see, I take a big flat brush yeah. and go, what is the gesture of that tree? Ask yourself, what is a gesture? That's the, that's the core of any painting, right? You're capturing the gesture, the essence. That's okay, let's say my gesture of tree is an inverted triangle you know, funny looking kind of tree like that's leaning towards that. I start off like this, big shapes. Then, because I paint all one layer in digital and gouache painting, Marco Bucci does this as well, by the way. Um, right. I will start carving into that shape. Think of yourself as a sculptor, okay? So I think of myself very much like a sculptor where I go, okay, now I'm adding and then detracting, right? Um, right. And you can, and Mike Hernandez actually taught me this. You can actually get way more interesting shapes like this. Which one is more interesting? Yeah. Which one's more interesting? This one or this one, right? You start getting more gesture like that. Okay. I'm sorry. That was my um, So but like it's really tough to, uh, to get the differentiation between middle ground, foreground and background. I mean, just with two values, it's, it's, it gets difficult. Yes. That's where you have to practice your, your sense of um, your, 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 uh, sense of Simplific grouping uh, yes yeah yeah so sometimes in matrix studies you will have to make choices where you you know that something is in the shadow but you might have to make it light and so i talk about this all in my mentorships that's a design aspect and sometimes it'll be a value right. aspect but you're always making those design choices um you know studying yeah. anchor pain is great for that so basically what i'm trying to do right now is i am i'm basically just fumbling around Really, I am. Because art is searching. You have to be able to embrace that and not be scared. A lot of times why people are scared and they start nitpicking because they're, they're afraid to put these big strokes down. And a lot of times it's these big strokes that can help you find new new things. Right here, I feel I see a beautiful opportunity um, to sort of start adding these lighter value myths. And so I bring up Ray Roberts here because this is another example of how he's beautifully grouping all those rocks. Right. You can see within those rocks, he I mean, basically almost the same color palette. Um, he has warms and cools. OK, but he, he hasn't lost the design of it, which is um, all these rocks are interconnected. That's what creates interest in this painting. If he had rendered every single painting, it would have been, you know, been no doubt beautiful in its own sense. But would, have, would it have been maybe as powerful as something like this, where he looked at that large rock mass and just knew enough to group the shadow shapes together and and elicit the rocks through the light, right? So um, that was a painting that I that I referenced immediately. And I know, you know, things like this with silhouette, I'm already starting to push um, all those color temperatures right there. And I know this part, God, I just, I can see, I'm trying to push these really subtle, but you see, I'm and this is, this is easily could turn into a color course, but there was another whole thing about color as well. Um, so, you know, here I'm just subtly think I could push some of those purple grays and all that stuff here. Um, at this stage, I'm still in the beginning stages, right? I haven't pushed, I'm still using my favorite block and brush. I'm not gonna switch to my other favorite one. Um, this one will give me a little bit more. Um, heed maybe um let's see uh, and i think here actually what would be really cool is to sort of be able to when i squint i'm always squinting actually i'm going to look at this as a smaller because that will help me a lot and oftentimes when i paint from reference images that is basically how big i am um i am looking at a reference image so that I don't get caught up. Uh, yes, yeah, someone had a question? And I think it's Anna Perna? Uh, no, no, I, I was just uh, clarifying if it's matrix studies, like M-A-T-R-I-X. Yeah, matrix, they're called NOTAN or matrix studies, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I first discovered them um, in Bill Perkins class. And, uh, and I didn't really do them at all until like they came back to me. And um, I was like, Oh, these are really helpful. 
Yes. Okay, so let's see what I'm doing. So at this stage, I'm gonna duplicate it. I'm just gonna start smudging some things to, um, oops, what are they doing? Why is it not going bigger? To sort of see how, where I can let go of things and where I can continue to build up. So I will over smudge a lot. This stage is really important to me. And I do that with a lot of paintings where I'm like, where it's super complex. And I'll basically just do this. Um, I'm gonna go back to my other favorite block in. Uh, I do this when, uh, actually I'm gonna expand this just a little bit more, hold on. When it comes out to ratios, ratios is very important. And the reason why I'm gonna group this all into one, because then what I can do is I can group this and then I can, I can group this and I can look at my matrix studies and see, okay, so let's see, I push that diagonal there. And oftentimes these actually tell me the answer. So I'm going, okay, I need to push these rocks maybe a little bit like, higher. I don't really like the design. I, I'm, I'm more thinking about design most of the time than like over color because design does not come as naturally to me as color. So I'm, I'm constantly thinking about that more. And if you could see my brain right now, it's probably like freaking out right now because I'm like, how do I do these rocks? I just don't think naturally with rocks. Um, but I like to paint things that uh, that throw me off a little bit. So um, here I'm thinking maybe I need to leave a little bit more space here. I'm still kind of having the idea of this rule of thirds in my head and sort of trying to get the impression really quick of rocks um, without sort of trying to find that balance of how I can find the hard, starting to figure out where I can find the hard and soft edges. Now I'm already sort of thinking ahead, but I think this will sort of help me um, as I sort of starting to carve some of these rocks out. I need to zoom in just a little bit to see how there's a plateau right here, which is around that midpoint. This comes down right here. There's another rock sitting right there. And for me, how I make sense of rocks is basically like, masses and then I will break up those masses with the with the um, negative shape or not I don't like to say negative shape but with the with the other shape so very similarly to how I paint a tree um by the way with these with the light hitting here I am um let's see I'm trying to figure that out I am uh, I'm not using white by the way um and the reason the reason why I wanted to pick this photo was because a lot of times people will pick blue and then they'll kind of do something like gray and for the rocks and things like that. I'm using, I like to use sort of a, a linden kind of yellow <clears throat> going on. Um, let's, let's just play around with some other fun. Um, where's my favorite? Uh, brushes. Okay, no, not this one. Um, this one, I think I could really play with lightening up some of that area and just throwing in some, some texture. Now, I don't make any of these brushes um, and I probably should, um, but I've sort of just taken some of these and tweak them along the way. Um, so this is sort of, I count as my watercolor brush. And then these kinds of brushes, like these brushes right here, where there's sort of like a jitter. I won't really be using these brushes till like later on, because to me, those, they, they add this sort of noise and I can do it now. Um, they add this sort of noise that I like to play around with after I've sort of figured out more of like, until I'm happy with the design, because these kind of stuff sort of distract me. Um, now, another thing is, um, figuring out the sheen right now, a lot of times people think with the sheen, I'm going to do this on a new layer, you know, water can be quite easy or complex, how you make it right, you could, you could capture water in one stroke or just, you know, over, over do it for lack of a better word. So let's see if we can start putting in some fun colors now I just want to pop a little bit I don't like this area at all. That interesting, weird looking rock is like that subtle, that subtle face, see that was too light of a value. That subtle face hitting there is just barely, and I think there's some uh, warmth going on right there, but I'm more, I'm more curious about how I can sort of 
designed this rock to be. Um, very interesting. So I don't know what this part is. Um, and I have to constantly zoom out. I hate this rock right here. Maybe I just want to include it. I don't know. I have to figure that out. Painting is problem solving, guys. So you see me problem solving on the spot because I don't ever practice any of these. Um, which is which is what I like because for me, I become very stale if I know how the outcome should be or, um, you know, it's no fun for me either. Um, so right now I am, oops, maybe that's two. So you see how, because that's in shadow, this whole area just sucks. Oh my God, I need to merge this and smudge this whole area. So this is what I do when I'm stuck, you see? And then when I smudge, this is like one of my favorite smudge tools, then I'll see new areas to sort of be like, okay, okay, where can I, where can I refine that pattern? Oftentimes I'll smudge in the direction of what I need. And maybe what I'll do now. Yes, Z. Hi. Um, so I see how you're grouping the shadow and the light together, but um, my question is how you group color together within that. I group color together through um, basically shifting color temperatures through correct value. Um, or a similar value. So for example, you see here, you know, I see that this whole rock face right here, right? This, this I can see, let me do a different color. This I can see an opportunity to group while subtly shifting in warms and cools, right? So kind of what I'm doing here, but this area is a lot warmer. Um, so this, this painting, it's actually quite a tricky painting. Um, let's see, sample all layers. Why is it not working? That's weird. Um, so basically, for example, going back to Ray Roberts, you see how he's grouping, he's grouping um, value and color through these shadow shapes, right? If I color pick any of those colors here, you see those are all colors from the shadow. I turn it black and white, it's similar value. That's how you start grouping color together. Does that make sense? Right, okay, so how do you decide um where you're going to do warm and cool or is it just a matter of um making that as a design decision um i mean some of it has to do with with light logics like for example the light is coming from this way so that's why you see the light is actually shining from behind and seeping in over the rocks that's why this area is warmer right um so that's sort of oops that sort of light logic in itself like that and then sometimes you know, even within an area where, um, I don't like this brush, even within an area, I'm just creating really ugly shapes, um, where like, like here, I can have like, if I zoom in right here, I can have an opportunity to, to push like slightly warmer and slightly cooler. And that, that to me, honestly, there's no right or wrong answer or no method. Like there's nothing I can say to be like, now you push it warm, now you push it cool. It comes with intuition. It's largely intuition. And to build up that intuition takes years, right? I can't give you a straight answer. Like for example, I feel like here it would be cooler, but then I could, I kind of wanted to have a sense of maybe pushing it that's too warm, but pushing, pushing some mist you know, right, right here, some, some sort of, and see how that feels with that sort of yellowish gray. I'm basically playing with neutral grays right now, right? I just have to, part of me has to just play around. How do I, how did I do this in the, so I grouped that all in one shape. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's partly with, um, cause I got this question before and like, why do I, like, why do I have the magenta there? I don't know. I just think that it would feel good against hitting that warmth a little bit. You don't see it in the photo, but I, I see a little bit of, of uh, like, maybe I could push a little bit of red there. Now the rocks in the back here, you know, they're very interesting because basically they're, it's a very, I would say I could push the shadows warmer. It feels like a very overcast day. So I'm actually going to push the shadows a little bit warmer. And what I'm going to try to do here is I'm going to try to actually group all these, find a value to group all these values, let's see, together. And then I'm going to try to, uh, I'm going to try to do this method, basically the same method you saw me do with the people. Um, let's see, I'm going to smudge right here so we can sort of get a little bit of that a little bit of a, 
that. And then I'm going to try to, um, to bring it out. Let's see what I'm going to pick a sort of cooler yellow um, right here. And you see how it's very similar to how if you just have that correct shadow shape, you can really start to sort of highlight these rock shapes and create the illusion of these rocks being subtly hit. Um, um, by by the light, right? And then there's some darker rocker formations right here. Did you raise your hand again, Z? No, I think I forgot to unraise it. Right. Oh, okay. Some people are raising there. I'm not sure if it's because you guys are keep asking questions, but you see how you can shorthand that a lot. And this is sort of a shorthand, you know, that you can do with now. Now the tricky part is how I can connect this, you know, these lights. So they don't look something like this, right? A lot of times what I'll see people's like, oh, and they, and they do all these like different, you know, and it starts looking very um, like polka dotty for lack of a better word. So it's like, how do you now tastefully design some of that? And that's that's all designed to me. Like this is all, like what I'm doing right now is figuring out in front of you guys, like how I would slowly, and I'm working quite slowly right now, in my opinion, um, how I would slowly figure, you know, figure, figure this out. Do I want part of this to be blocked in, you know, into haze like that? Here I can see an opportunity for just grouping these lighter values and sort of bringing them in there like that. But in my opinion, I need to figure out, I've been neglecting the water. Now the tricky part with this piece is now finding the energy of that water. I think I'm literally, I did a, a similar piece, actually one of my beginning pieces was an infinite paint. It was, was figuring out um, how to find the energy of that water, which I think is gonna kick my ass. You can see right there, I put a shape right there just to see how I feel like to sort of you know start kind of thinking in terms of smaller shapes, in terms of um, geometrically, I haven't even played with much noise or texture or anything yet. Because um, I just wanna focus on carving out those those shapes first and kind of, so you see I'm slowing down a little bit. I'm, I'm starting to think, okay, how do each of these, like how do each of these notes, like if I put down a light shape right there, like this is what's so interesting to me, how does that read farther in the distance? Like how is that, how is that shape um, uh, vi uh, what, what impression is that creating, if that makes sense? That is what is so fascinating to me about painting. Um, it's not so much like trying to, like it's like when I put down a stroke, what does that read as? What, how is that color temperature like largely shift? Um, like if I'm looking at a rock, if I'm looking at a grouping of a rock, if I put down a shape right there, how does that connect right there? Obviously still haven't figured out that part. That, that is the part where I will slow down and I can you know take hours just sort of experimenting with that. Um, if I had, let's see a, um, you know, how do you even, you know, one thing Mike Hernandez once said, he's like, you know, digital and gouache both have their beauties, right? If you're gonna play with digital, explore how digital brushes can sort of, you know, so now I'm playing around with this brush and kind of figuring out and carving for lack of a better word. And then you can see I'm always zooming out because I'm always trying to see how it works. And I like to say that every painting, you have a moment where you're frustrated, you're frustrated, you're frustrated, and at one point you cross the threshold. <laughs> that's the part I'm always looking for. You're always trying to look to cross the threshold in painting. At least that's what my journey always is. It's never smooth sailing. It's never like, oh, it's linear. It's never linear, guys. If you think that I paint and it's easy peasy for me, I always hit a point where I'm like, F this piece. I'm going to take a break because I don't know what I'm doing. Always. Because you, 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 you are trying to surpass what you're what you already know, right? That's what a good painter is. You're not trying to do what you already know. You're trying to push past something. That's gonna take conflict. Now your, your, your job as an artist is to solve that conflict. You know, how are you going to solve that? And so every time I paint something, it's never smooth sailing. Um, 
but the thrill for me comes from kind of figuring that out a little bit. I'm gonna just see what value that is. So that's like a blue. Um, so I had the right value. I just need to push it warmer. Yes, Ignacio. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, uh, just a quick question. Um, I wrote in the chat, but I, I, uh, my English is not very good. So I'm gonna just read it from the chat. Um, I was gonna ask you if you could point out any specific difference that would emerge by using a, a hard dead brush uh, while you are doing this painting. Sorry, I was just reading the, the, the chats. Um, what it, can you repeat your question? Uh, is there any any specific things that uh, like would change if you uh, you if you were using um, a hard edge brush brush? Yeah, a lot of things would change. Actually, I paint with um, I love the simple hard brush, so I can I can demo that really quick now. Um, really quick to the question. Yeah, I might add a person. I'm not sure. Um, actually, I kind of don't want to for this one. I kind of just want it to be nature for reasons. I don't know, maybe I can't explain why, but um, I will actually use this hard brush a lot for um, for things like water, believe it or not. Um, it will, it, it actually, like for little notes like this, this is how I get my hard edges. And then a lot of times I will, um, I will smudge, I will smudge part of that. But for example, if I wanted a really delicate edge, maybe like, I don't know, right there or something, I will sometimes use a hard brush for that. Um, and I'll go back and forth. For work, when I do color keys, I only use the hard brush. Um, I use the hard brush and maybe like a quick block in. And for a lot of my paintings, like for, you know, even this one, I, you see how if I zoom in, you know, that, that hard jitter brush, it's basically this brush, but it's still a hard brush. Um, so yes, to, to answer your question short, I love the hard brush because it 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 gives me that really um, fast. Um, if I could, let's see where I can demo this. Like here, if I just put down a brush, maybe right there, you can see how that edge right there. And if I smudge it right there, uh, let's see where I smudge it. I could smudge, you know, down like this, and then part of that edge would be lost, but then part of that edge would be would be hard. And that's the balance of hard and soft edges. I think someone had had a question. Um, for example, where would I have a hard edge is, you know, where the light is hitting the people right here, right? Um, that when you zoom out, it's going to be very crisp. Whereas here, I've actually smudged some of the people and you can see they're quite loose here. Um, where I have a hard edge is where the light is just basically carving out the, um, the, the tree, right? It's basically having that glow. And then, um, and then, um, and then everywhere else, you can see the buildings and everything, right? Um, it is already misty here, but even here, I took liberties. I didn't want to have all that detail in the building. You can see how roughly I just basically indicated it, just a few windows and um, just enough to give the impression that that's a building. And that to me is sort of choosing your hierarchy in your painting, where you want your level of hard edges and clarity. I kind of associate hard edges with clarity, right? When we, set, when we want our eye to go somewhere, you typically have more contrast and value, saturation and edges. And then when you want things to sort of die down in the background, typically you have softer edges and you group your shapes more, you have larger shapes, kind of a rule of thumb. Of course, this can all be broken, right? Um, rules are kind of made to be broken in art. Um, so, so you can see here, basically everywhere the light is hitting, that is where I'm having the hard edge. I've grouped the shadow of the people together. You see, even here, you could see those people distinctly in the back right there, but I was like, ah, they're kind of distracting. So I'm just gonna group them and I'm just going to indicate it. And actually, this was actually way easier to paint than I thought it would be because of the fact that I knew that I could group that. Um, it was actually, this was actually one of the pieces where I was like, oh, this is actually smoother sailing than I thought it would be. Um, so kind of like that. Uh, okay, what are good? Yeah. yeah, does that make sense? Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What are good re what are good resources to learn matrix studies? Um, I think a book called 
framed ink is a really good one. I'm gonna go for about 10 more minutes and then we'll, till 11 and that, or 12 and then we'll call it. I know you guys have other talks to go to. Um, I'm going to finish this piece. I'll see if I can do a recording on my screen or sorry, not this piece, this piece. Um, it's still definitely in this beginning stages. And for me, the thing about demos is I can only get to a certain stage where I need to be by myself and really melt into the painting. It's really hard for me to talk and paint at the same time, but because of an hour, usually, usually I can do this. I did this one in the span of like four hours it took me. So I would need that probably amount of time. Um, although I guess in mentorships, right, Alex, I have done demos that were more or less, it depends. It depends guys. Um, so what was I saying? Yeah, Framed Ink is a really good book. I would highly recommend you guys get to learn about design, framing. And he does a lot of, the author of that does a lot of um, matrix studies. So I would highly, highly recommend um, um, getting that book. I think that book, other than that study, um, Jeremy Fenske, he's a good friend of mine. He does a lot of, um, he does a lot of, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, he did like a matrix study a day and you can see just how well he improved um, because of because of doing that. Like here, I wanna definitely have like a crisper edge right there. I'm gonna play around with this a little bit. Um, so, so he's a really good one. I would suggest you reach out to him. Uh, I don't know if he's doing a talk, um, but he did talk for my mentorship students. And um, he was showing all his pieces and it was just so cool to see. Um, now someone mentioned darker belt. I wanna show you something if you put a value because I basically am, am grouping all these. If I put a value that was um, too dark here, how, how much that would stand out because I'm trying to group it. You see that value? Actually, it's okay right now. But to me, maybe I'm almost near the blast, but maybe I could brush it in that's starting to flatten it out for me a little bit. And that's why I try to be very careful about how to subtly push those darker values. Um, definitely can push, can push some of the values here more. I'm gonna just start to push some of those darker values, even in the foreground to start carving out some of those rocks you can see. Um, but I'm gonna show you really quick how if I just decide to paint the straight gray, which I see this a lot and people go, oh, things are in shadow, they're gray. Let me make this clear. It will work if it's the correct value, okay? So it's not like you can't ever use grays. It's just not as interesting, okay? So if I just did this as, you know, sort of like, like this and I was like this and then this was a gray and then this was a lighter gray. Oops, that's too light, sorry. Like it would still work. It's just not as interesting as if you were, I was talking about earlier, shifting, uh, training yourself to subtly shift in color temperature, right? Another technique, actually, I can't believe I didn't even use this. This is a technique that I love to do. So I will do this and I actually build up a lot of my um, um, thumbnail studies this way. So if you guys, I'm gonna pull up my um, thumbnail studies. Um, I build up these thumbnails that is I do for myself. These are done on Photoshop. I only build up these, these using the rectangular tool and the circle tool. So I'll show you what I mean by that. And I can't believe I forgot. I haven't painted like this in a while, so I kind of forgot. Um, so you see here, if you zoom in, I basically use this shape right here. Don't know what it's called, rectangle and ellipse and the smudge tool, that's it. This is another great way for you to practice value. Okay, so I will I will start to demo it. Um, um, and this and this is another way. Someone asked me how do I get hard edges. This is another way I love to get hard edges. So you can see it seems very tedious, but I love this way, and I love this method. And I'll always go back to this method one way or another because it just lets me see how those fractal of shapes. Like I can put a shape as small that, and it'll just let me see how that shape is. Um, uh oh, I put a shape in the wrong area. How that shape is being affected, or is affecting them if I put down a really small shape, like right there. Let's say I lighten the value a little bit. I love to observe those little um, little intricacies. So uh, I, I will create full paintings like this. It's, you know, 
Sometimes people will challenge themselves by doing just the hard brush painting. Lip Camarella has done that. Um, but I can compose a whole painting like this. You can see I have it at 80% opacity and that's why you can start to see through it a little bit. But it, it becomes kind of pixelated. But then what I'll do is I will now, I'll go back and I'll start smudging some areas into the shadow, right? So if I were to, let's say, merge this, I will start now, where can I smudge, right? Where can I bring out a little bit of that reflection a little bit more here? And actually what I'm gonna do, maybe I'll switch the circle. So the reason why I love these tools is because our eye goes back to being familiar with the base, most basic of shapes, which is the circle, the rectangle, the triangle. There is a triangle as well. And you can actually have a lot of fun. And because it's basically um, oh, like a solid shape, you really practice um, value this way, right? So um, it's just a really fun uh, exercise for me. Like it's really challenging. And I basically just like, I start grouping them, right? You're like, but then you're going to see a lot of little triangles, Tiffany. Well, no, because I end up grouping the shapes together. Does that make sense? So like here, I'll have to find a right value. And this is basically where if you look at my paintings, you'll see like solid shapes of color. That's where I'm trying to push. Like I'll push maybe like a warmer, I don't know, like something here. Maybe that's too dark in value, but um, you see how I'm searching for that right value. And that's how I get those those color shifts that you guys, you know, see in my paintings, it's handmade like this. I like to just literally think about how I can, you see, I'm pushing a little bit of green there, how I can, you know, carve out this edge more and just carve it out like that. And sometimes that's how I do trees, right? Going back to the whole carving in of a tree, I will paint a tree simply like this um, by taking, I did an Arthur Street and study. If you guys look at my Instagram, I have I have a reel of how I built it up. I built it up just like this. Uh, I have no secrets. It's just like very simple. Um, and I just switch from like, if one method's not working for me, I switch to another method, but I always try to switch it up so that um, I don't remain stagnant. And so yeah, like this part, I'm still trying to figure out. So I know I won't be able to get that. So maybe I'll just, I have to find a brush. And this is why I love this brush because this brush is actually, great for water and getting a little bit of that sort of opacity coming in and just finding a little bit more of those uh, rhythms that are coming in. Um, so it's just that constant fun search that you have to invite in. Um, and so you see when I put a lighter value there, I, I, I'm inadvertently carving a darker value as well. Right. When I put a darker value there, that value feels lighter and it's all and painting is all about that comparison. Right. Where when you put a light shape, you are actually also at the same time carving out a dark shape. Right. Um, that is the beauty. The light doesn't exist without the dark. The dark doesn't exist without the light. I should also say that I have a free PDF and I'll go ahead and share my screen and show you guys my website where you can download a free PDF. I talk about my seven foolproof ways to create a better painting. It's free for everyone. I put my heart and soul into making it. Um, and there are these tips that I just wanted to share. Um, like, how could I, and I haven't even used, um, at this point, I haven't even used, like, um, I could, adjustment layers and stuff. Uh, for my own work, I don't use that quite so often as for, like, work work, because it just becomes a lot faster. Like, how could I carve out that rock right there? How could I carve this shape now into that, right? Be, be very definite about your strokes and how you are, right? Um, Marco Mestre, yes, he's a great one. Um, that is him. I think he has another book too, like Framed Me Too. How can I carve into here is that this rock feels like it's in between, right? This rock is being subtly lit like that. You see, now I just created a rock just like that right there. You see that? Through light and shadow, right? No need to overthink too much. Now, I'm, I think right now is when I'm starting to hit the threshold of, okay, I'm seeing something, right? Um, that's when I have that fun of, um, of painting around. Um, what I can do is uh, I can, 
if you guys want, as an exercise, I can upload this photo in the chat. You guys can um, do your own study if you weren't already painting with me. Um, and if you want, you can tag me, Tiffany Mang Art, put simplicity, I don't know, I'll have to think of a hashtag or something. I just thought of this last minute. Um, but um, would you guys like that? Yes, no? Um, there is the button of you. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah now, now this is the time where I could paint for hours and just melt in, right? Um, painting, I know, can be uh, stressful because you're not um, getting the results that you want, right? Once you accept that that's probably going to happen and you change your framework to it being, okay, I suck as a painter, I can't do this versus, okay, I can problem solve this. What, what are the things I can do to problem solve? I read this in a book by, um, the one art book I have, not one art book, by James Reynolds, another wonderful painter, okay? Um, I don't know where I'm gonna repost this. I have to talk to Lightbox. I might put it on my, um, I might put it on my YouTube actually. That's what I'll do. Not the actor, okay? Not the actor, James Reynolds. This is another oil painter dude. Um, and he has this one book that is super rare and I got it. And um, and he said one thing that just really struck out to me, right? He said, or no, Richard Schmidt said this. I'm sorry, is Richard Schmidt and James Reynolds? I think they both said it, you know? Rewiring your framework. I cannot stress how important this is. Painting is a lifestyle, okay? Like if you really truly want to get better, it's not just, it is putting in the hours, but it is putting, it is letting yourself be open to failure and be open to mistakes. Like if anyone asks me what the most important thing I'll partake, I'll share with them, it's this. As a painter, you cannot be afraid to take risks. You probably heard it a million times. I will tell it again. You are going to fail. You are going to make paintings that you don't like. It's inevitable. It's not one plus one equals two. Once you accept that, it's like, oh my God, okay, today wasn't my painting day. What can I do better next time? Do you see the freedom in that, right? You see the freedom in, in, in once you, you rewire back, what are you going to do to do better and not remake those mistakes that you did last time? How, what are you going to do to reapproach a painting and, and, not, and, 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 and change you know, the workflow that you do and find something new in that way, right? Um, I can't tell you how many times I've done a painting I don't like and, and then just took a break from it and then come back and then suddenly, aha, I feel, I, I see what it is that I need to fix because it was just there in front of me. I just was too tunnel vision, right? Um, which is probably, and I bring this up because, you know, that is, that is so important. Like I'll probably take a break from this and I'll probably come back and be like, oh, I need to fix this and that, blah, blah, blah. Um, and and that is so important. Um, so, you know, I want to end with that because it's already 12. Um, and, you know, I think, I think having an important mindset is just so, so integral. I can't even tell you the paintings that my most favorite paintings I've done are paintings where I had no expectations for how it was going to turn out. I just knew that I wanted to have fun and I was going to let my heart guide me as cheesy as that sounds. Um, but art is very closely related to, you know, emotions and the soul and all, and, you know, all that stuff. So those, those are the paintings I most enjoyed and the paintings that I'm proud of versus, you know, other ones where sometimes I just was too closely knit to this vision. It's a fine balance between organization and chaos. And by chaos, I mean inviting the unknown, right? Inviting what you might not know happen, but seeing, but but knowing that it could lead to something even more beautiful than you ever imagined, right? And this is where I just love philosophy. And I think painting ties into philosophy and I love reading books about that and stuff. Um, but that is what I kind of want to um, um, end with guys. Um, let me up, Let me go ahead and, up, uh, oh, that's ugly. I don't like that. Um, upload the photo. Um, hold on. Where am I? So I don't know. You can see the steps that I that I did. Right, first this, 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 and then this. Okay, so this is probably the cross the threshold where I'm going to start really slowing down now. Okay.
So this is the extra tidbit where you guys get to see, which is not in the workshop, of my finished piece. I think I spent around four-ish hours after the workshop to work on this, and I really had a fun time slowing down, thinking about the shapes I was putting down, playing with some adjustment layers to play with some pops and saturation in the shadows of the rocks, as you can see, really emphasizing the atmosphere even more, and just really just me melting, and I like to say marinating into the painting. I'm actually going to now show you the steps one by one. So you can see this is what I started off. This is uh, at the beginning of the workshop where you can see I'm just getting those big chunky shapes down. I'm not focused on detail. I'm not really even focused on design. I'm more focused about getting the whole dance kind of started with my painting. Now you can see as we slowly build up, it's not even near where I want it to be, but at least I'm starting to think about, okay, where could these little cogs of intricacy start to be introduced, right? Um, it's still very rough at this point, And of course, colors could really be pushed. Now here is where I was started remembering, thinking, okay, I'm starting to find something here and that got exciting. And I could have stopped, not really at this stage, but I could have, but I pushed myself even more. I think it was 12 a.m. or something, I don't even know. 11 a.m., 12 a.m., I was like, oh, I'm on to something, I just need to keep painting. And those moments are really valuable to hold on to. And this is what I did, as you can see here, I just pushed it a little bit more, a little bit more. And then when I compared this one to the previous one, you go, wow, how did I think I could stop before? You know, that's why I really, every time I think I'm done, it's like, mm, let me just take a break, come back, because there's always something I'll see from taking a break and coming back to the painting. And you can see here in this final one, just very, very slight changes. And the changes will get smaller and smaller. I want to emphasize this one more time. Um, as you get further and further into the painting, you're not looking for big drastic changes because hopefully at this point you've solidified design and you're really just kind of experimenting and um, putting on these small accents that can really help the painting. And here I just wanted to show you and compare the photo with the reference. As you can see, I um, kind of cropped it in a little bit and I didn't copy the rocks completely because there's so much complexity going on that you know I have to redesign and reorganize it for myself. So um, yeah, you can see how I use the photo as reference, but I'm not copying it much for color at all. And in the end, I'm really really searching within myself to push what I see in my mind, those purples that you see and everything else, that is from my intuition. So now I wanna show you guys where you can find more of my videos on my site. If you go to my site, tiffanymang.com, click on the drop down menu under links and click tutorials, you'll find this. I'm part of MFA, which stands for Made for Artists. I have a lot of videos on gouache and digital painting that you can find all of them if you just pay a monthly subscription. I also have YouTube where you can find a lot of videos on gouache and digital painting as well that are shorter, some are time lapses, and as well as my Gumroad, which I have a lot of shorter time lapse and quick tutorials as well. Now here is where you can download my free PDF, seven foolproof steps to creating a better painting. Like I said, it is free. It is my seven top tips and is for you to keep and share. All I ask is that you share this with your friends and spread the word. I really made this with my heart and soul and I'm really excited to share it with you guys. These tips are near and dear to my heart and I've learned these through trial and error in my own painting journey. So I hope that you guys find it helpful as well. Now, if you also go on my social media tab, you'll find that I have Instagram and YouTube. Instagram is my main platform where I update everything the most, so be sure to follow me. And if you go on my YouTube, this is a fast link for where you can kind of access a bunch of videos. And I'm going to be updating my YouTube more as well. And you can see here, I have digital playlist and a gouache playlist. If you go on my website, subscribe to my newsletter, I will let you, I will be sending out emails then. I'm also trying to start a blog, um, which I'm really excited about. So um, I think I'm going to start a blog and basically that's going to be with my boyfriend where we're going to be talking about all things creative and art. So he's really into filming and we're going to try to create this whole awesome thing. We're going to film me painting. I'm going to be sharing tips on art, but not just art, even books we read because we really like to read and things that we we, we just found that moved us and um, we want to share with you guys. So that's, I have a few ideas in mind. So just 
keep updated on the Instagram and I'll let you guys know. Yeah. Awesome. Just threw a lot at you guys again. Thanks so much for coming, everyone, and catch you guys later. <laughs> Bye.